my name is Jürgen Flöger. I'm talking to you from Kidney Week in San Diego. But I'm originally from Aachen, Germany. Um, this is where the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany meet. So it's very central in Europe. I'm a senior professor there at the university, which implies you have no salary, but you can do what you want. I highly recommend that. And one of the things I want to do is KDGO. Uh, so I'm co-chair of the KDGO Glomerular Disease Guidelines together with Brad Rovin. And I'm here in that role today. So in the 2021 guideline on IgA nephropathy, we recommend you to use the International IgA Nephropathy Prediction Tool because this is simply the best we have to date. But I think it's very important you realize the limitations of that tool. First of all, it's based on historical cohorts, large cohorts, close to 4,000 patients, but historical, obviously, where even RAS blockers were not always used, and essentially nobody had an SGLT2 inhibitor on board. So that is a major limitation. And we've come to learn that the other major limitation is that it predicts 80 months from the kidney biopsy, which seems to be a long time. It's close to six years. But in the life of a, let's say, 30-year-old patient, six years is nothing. So very clearly, that is the major limitation because we have learned that, for example, you have a proteinuria between half a gram and a gram per day. By the old guidelines, that would be viewed as low risk. And the IGAN prediction tool would tell you your risk of reaching kidney failure in the next 80 months is, I don't know, 10% or something. And my patient would be kind of relieved. It's 10%. But if you really look at 15 years, like they did in the British radar data analysis, if I tell that same patient your risk in 15 years is 50%, that patient is terribly worried. And that patient has a totally new concept of the disease and that we need to do something. And I think that is absolutely vital. We're not talking about a short-term disease, and, and we'll come back to this when we talk about treatment. We talk about a disease that goes for decades because these are young adults. And it's a total catastrophe when one of them ends up on dialysis because they are only kidney patients. They are, have usually no major heart problem. They usually have no major vascular problem. So once they make it on dialysis, they, they live. And they will give you decades of very costly treatment. And we need to keep that in mind when we talk about cost effectiveness of some of these new therapies. So in the past, we have traditionally slowly uptitrated treatment. We have started a RAS blocker after the kidney biopsy and whatever antihypertensive we need and lifestyle education and so forth. And then at some point after several months of uptitrating that, we had thought about steroids or not steroids. In the course of doing so, and, and I've had more than one patient, patients lost GFR. And they lost 5 to 10 mils of GFR right in front of my eyes, which for a 30-year-old is a catastrophe. It's gone permanently. A nephron gone, lost is a nephron for, lost forever. I think the major paradigm shift in the treatment of IgA nephropathy, and we will propose that in the guideline, is that we turn things around. We have to become what the rheumatologists have already learned, hit hard and early. Hit them hard before a joint is irreversibly damaged. Now replace joint with nephron before a nephron is lost. Risking, and I totally share your concerns, risking that we may overtreat some patients, but then we can taper down. And I would rather taper down than watching GFR get lost and then taper up and respond to decreasing GFR. Why didn't we do that in the past? because we were so concerned about corticosteroid side effects. We now have safer, much safer therapies, costly, but safe. So this is a total change in how uh, we advocate to treat these patients. Let's go to the next question, and I'm, I'm going to read it to you because it's fairly complex. 
Are there differences in the kidney function protection associated with proteinuria reduction delivered by drugs that reduce proteinuria via a predominantly hemodynamic effect, as opposed to those that reduce proteinuria by reducing pathogenic forms of IgA? That is a complex question, but the question is very nice because it exactly illustrates the dichotomy that we advocate now in treating these patients. And I tell every patient of mine, hey, you have two diseases. By the time they make it to my office, they have CKD, and that will not go away. That is CKD for lifelong uh, treatment, pro destined to have need lifelong treatment. And on the other hand, you have an immune disease called IgA nephropathy, and that may require a different therapy. And ideally, we stop that by shutting down the production of pathogenic forms of IgA. Having said that, we don't really know what are those pathogenic forms of IgA that deposit in the kidney. And that, that also illustrates yet another dilemma. We have no good biomarkers because we still have no firm understanding on how this disease develops. Yes, we can measure galactose-deficient IgA1, but the association with the disease is modest at best, and we're not 100% convinced that that is the only form that deposits 20% of all of us um, in the room and outside have IgA deposits in the kidney. It's scary. I hope I'm not that 20%. But if you do autopsy studies, many of us have IgA in the kidney, and it's certainly not galactose-deficient IgA1 only. Again, this dichotomy is important for the new therapy. One is CKD therapy, and clearly the major, major, major thing is getting the blood pressure down. I have no firm target. I tell all my patients, I want you to be dizzy once a week. If you're dizzy once a day, I'm overdoing it. But that's probably a good way of explaining in simple words to patients on how to, uh, how to deal with blood pressure. And we have ample evidence that in addition to blood pressure, RAS blockers are key, and we've always done it. And nowadays, I also add an SGLT2 inhibitor, which has relatively little effect on the glomerular pressure or systemic blood pressure, but I add it without even thinking. That's the CKD side. On the immune side, the drugs that we have today, like Neficon, um, they do impact on galactose-deficient IgA1, which we believe is a biomarker of the disease. But we will get other drugs, and I'm really looking forward to next year when we see all these new drugs that target the lymphocytes and make them switch, uh, switch off or down the production of all these IgA forms. IgA nephropathy typically is not a super inflammatory disease like ankyovasculitis or lupus, uh, where a hell of a lot of is going on in the glomerulus. Typically, you have a little bit of inflammation. And typically, we don't know what to do with it. We believe it's bad, it's probably bad, but we haven't really targeted this specifically. Now, that brings us to the value of the biopsy. And we very clearly say in the KDGO guidelines, determine the MESS score, which has inflammatory components in there, but don't base your therapy on it. And you can't overstress that because all the studies we have to date are retrospective studies associating the MESS score with outcome. It's a great prognostic tool, but we have little idea about the kinetics. We know from animal experiments that even a crescent can disappear in a week. So how can I base a long-term therapeutic decision on a change like that? Don't misunderstand me. If there's 50% of your biopsy, 50% of the glomeruli have crescents, and the GFR is falling rapidly, yes, then I respond to the biopsy. But only in the context of the falling GFR. So always assign it, combine it with the clinical findings. Never make a decision on a single crescent in a biopsy where there's a stable GFR. Now, 
inflammatory changes, many of the drugs that we have now target inflammatory changes. Neficon does, steroids do. Um, we will have more uh, new drugs like complement inhibitors target inflammatory changes. And there are first emerging data that we can even use markers of inflammatory changes to assess disease severity and prognosis. And a very promising marker, for example, is urinary C5, uh, C, CD163, not C5B29, but that's also an, an emerging interesting marker. And maybe they can give us an idea on what's going on upstairs in the kidney. And maybe, and I'm, I'm really stressing the maybe here, maybe they are future tools to guide treatment. So guideline implementation is nice, and we can recommend all these new drugs, but they're all costly. They're very costly. Um, and I think we nephrologists have to get used to that. To me, that's new, and to many of my colleagues, that's new. An oncologist will never complain if something costs half a million. For us, that's unusual. So many countries have limited resources. And in many countries, all these new drugs are simply not available. And that's where my plea comes that we shouldn't forget the old. We have good drugs. RAS blockers, SARTANs are great drugs in this setting. Why am I saying that? Because it's kind of interesting to see that even in all the contemporary trials, where everybody was supposedly on maximum tolerated or allowed RAS blocker dose, even there, GFR loss is fairly high. We have one trial recently that sticks out. It's the PROTECT trial. And I'm talking of the control arm. So PROTECT was Sparsentan versus Irbisartan. Everybody in the control arm had the 300 milligram Irbisartan dose. And PROTECT is notable for the GFR loss in the control group being 3.8 mils per minute per year. All the others had 5 to 10. Maybe suggesting that we could do a better job in using RAS blockers. And they're dirt cheap, of course. And don't forget the old data showing that you really have to block the RAS intensely. Let me give you a small story. I had an engineering student. Engineers are also humans, but different. And this guy was on four tablets of Ramipril a day, and I told him, hey, why don't you take one Candisartan a day? Didn't listen. He took four Candisartan. His proteinuria, two months later, fell from 3 gram to 0.3, simply by overdosing the Candisartan to 64 milligrams per day. Unfortunately, he told me he fainted when he was in a shower, so I told him to no longer shower, which, of course, is not realistic. But I'm just saying this to illustrate that we have therapy to do something about proteinuria, even in resource-limited settings. We have, and this is the most important half hour in the life of an IgA patient that I spent with them, I tell them what is good sport and bad sport. I tell them, don't go to the gym and lift 200 pounds or 100 kilogram weights. I tell them about smoking. If you smoke and have IgA, you're crazy. Um, your chance to go into kidney failure is sixfold higher. I tell them about salt, about what is good food, bad food. I tell them what is a good blood pressure for you. Remember the dizziness once a week, maybe without syncope. Um, and, and there's lots of things we can do. And interestingly, I see a lot of second opinion patients. Interestingly, they're referred to me by nephrologists, and usually I find something that I can do and tell patient that you can do better on this or that. So where do we go from here? Um, those of you who've been here at Kidney Week, it's an IGA week. Uh, it's everywhere. It's on buses, it's on hotel doors, it's in the foyer. Everything seems to be IgA nephropathy. Yes, there are other diseases still, but IgA is fairly dominant. So we'll be seeing more and more trials, 
And there are trials starting now. And of course, it's getting more difficult because you can no longer justify a placebo control. What do you test your new drug against? I don't think an ethics committee will grant you permission to test against placebo in the future if we have drugs that are licensed. On the other hand, we just discussed that we have many resource-limited countries. And we're not talking about a really poor country. We're talking about Canada. Canada has no way to get nephicon for the patients unless you have special deals or whatever. We're talking many European countries where you cannot get it. So probably we need to think of smart controls, not probably, certainly, um, for these phase three trials in the future. And the other thing that we really need to find out is what to do in the long run. These trials go for two, three years. We're talking about 20 to 30 years of disease. How often can I treat? How often can I retreat? And how safe is all that? That is something very important to find out, and combinations not to talk of that. That is something very important for the future, and I'm very certain that we will have more and more KDGO updates as we go along.